so for Kubernetes, you know, we talk a lot about unstructured data, SMB, NAS access, you know, it's great. Kubernetes is a little bit different, and with Kubernetes, we still have our regular abstraction layer, but with Kubernetes, we also allow you to get block access to data, because we can, we can. The Kubernetes infrastructure allows us to do that. Uh, so we can unify applications in Kubernetes, the outer hammer space that runs, outer block level access, and I'll show you some of these things, as well as file level and NFS level sharing within Kubernetes infrastructure. So it makes it really flexible. It also allows us to take all the existing infrastructure customers we have and make it Kubernetes native. You know, you take an old 3PAR, an old Hitachi, an old, you know, very new pure, and you just simply fold them into Hammerspace, and Hammerspace acts as the mechanism to store data on those storage devices, yet managing the metadata and the Kubernetes connectivity into that. Uh, so we have customers get really excited about this because they can take whatever they have and just start using Kubernetes. Uh, we also, because our global namespace, can tie this across distances. So now you can run Kubernetes in Google, in Amazon, on-prem, all seeing the same data. You can start a pod in Amazon in on-prem, you can stop it and just start it in Amazon. You still need to get the data there that the pod may need or may not need, but at least it's really, really simple. You don't need to sit there and figure out, mm. did I set up this relationship or replicate data correctly? Did I manually copy this file from here to here? No, it's just automated. It just sits there as part of the storage class and the PVs and PVCs you deploy. Uh, the other piece that I'm not gonna go into and show you today, but it's worth entering. Remember, David showed you a simulation where we can assimilate existing data from existing infrastructure, which means we can take, for example, a production environment, a snapshot of, it, say, a MySQL database running in production, assimilate that snapshot into Hammerspace and present that into a completely segregated and isolated network that Kubernetes runs in. Or even across to another site. Now, you can do a snapshot on-prem and then present that and use that in Amazon or Google or whatever site you like to run in. We think of that as data air gap because it allows you to access the data, but the consumer of the data has no idea that the data source might actually be in a production volume somewhere that was, was copied or either proactively or on demand. Right? Uh, we did obviously a CSI plugin for all this, uh, helps us. These are the three ways to consume storage in Kubernetes with Hammerspace. One is a block device. All of these are represented either by files or NFS shares within the Hammerspace infrastructure itself. Right? And all the features we've spoken about today, the metadata, the live data mobility, the global namespace, snapshots, clones, everything applies to this environment. It all happens you know, down here, it might be orchestrated from Kubernetes. Let's say you deploy a snapshot YAML or, or you deploy, you know, whatever provisioning of a new, you know, I'll do a MySQL database here or, or two, right? Uh, all that is instigated from up here, goes through and translates the appropriate pieces into our infrastructure. If needed, we, again, transfer that down into the underlying infrastructure. So, for example, if you let's say you take a snapshot of, of a pod, and that pod runs on, let's say, in NetApp and an Isilon and, and, and a DSX, all those platforms will do the cloning for you, so it's really fast and quick, space optimized, leveraging the platform's dedupes and so forth, if they have it on and so forth. What's the latency impact on write from that, though, if you had a, if you had a database, for example? Should be extremely quick. So the beauty of Kubernetes is that, and this is why, where's my pen? Uh, why we like Kubernetes so much, <laughs> one of the reasons is that it speaks NFS 4.2 natively. Parallel NFS. Yeah. Parallel NFS, right? So we've drawn a lot of pictures here. So if you have your, your pod up here, it sits with one of these, you know, let's say uh, just PV, PVC infrastructure, goes down to a file. This pod through its host is accessing that file directly to the underlying storage. Mm. There's no intermediary unless you want one. Okay. You can, but you don't have to. Unless you're running a host OS that doesn't support or have the NF NFS 4.42 driver installed, then you can do NFS v3. Mm -hmm. Perfectly supported, but then you're jumping through the DSX. This allows you to have direct access to the underlying storage. It's the fastest way you can get data. There's no, nothing in between. The metadata just tells you, hey, you start up the pod, you mount, mm -hmm. you access the data directly. Right, and this is where you know things like live data migration, snapshots, clones, all that work within that. And there's no disruption at all from, from the infrastructure, which is why you know these three aspects is really powerful because you deploy this on fast infrastructure, you're gonna get really, really fast response times because it's speaking directly to the underlying storage. And it's parallel scalable. Add more infrastructure, you get linear addition right. of performance because it's being routed directly and Right, so you got, this file can sit on, you know, I use NetApp, this file can sit on another NetApp, this file can sit on, or this share sits on, on another scale-out NAS system. It doesn't really matter. 
And you know, as long as the SLO, the David mentioned earlier, the service levels are being met to what you're being asked to deliver, we will move the data around to make sure it happens, or place it correctly from the beginning, right? Would you recommend using the CSI for the NFS option or use mm -hmm. just the native NFS? We, we prefer the option. CSI piece because it, it gives you the management capabilities for us. So we, have, have you done performance testing to see if one is more performant than the other? I've not compared it to. I know that this is... It, it maps this, directly to the NFS mounting command. So it is, once it's mounted, it's, okay. it's the same. Okay, so it's essentially it exactly using the NFS, same. But, yeah. yeah. It literally, if you did a, if you open up a shell inside, I guess, you'll see the NFS mount in there. Mm -hmm. And assuming it's a modern Linux you're running on, it'll be an NFS 4.2 mount. Again, data access going directly. What's the, uh, so if you want to establish storage classes, is that something that Hammerspace handles for you? So you can define them via policy and then exactly. it creates the storage classes? Correct. And so they can be dynamic. I'll show you in the demo here. We'll have time. They can be dynamic. What it look like. They can be Those, Yeah, the policy can include stuff that automatically tiers or promotes things. So unlike a storage mm -hmm. class in Kubernetes, you might think is a static, okay, this needs fast, this needs slow. This can tie into policy that itself is behavioral and actually does the promotion and demotion automatic. Okay. I mean, so you can, and, you know, in, in my demo setup, uh, or in my, my production lab, you know, you know, I have all these things set up. Like, so when pods are not running, they move to the cloud. Because there's no point in keeping them a local storage on my ESX servers I have because it's just wasting space. When I start them up, if I want them to start up quickly, I proactively push it in there. If not, it comes back in. And you know, when we measured you know, rehydration performance for a file, it might be 190 megs a second. It can go really, really quick if your infrastructure supports it. That's you know, a few tests we run. We can move with enough movers, we move gigabytes a second from cloud into NAS, assuming the infrastructure again can support it. So the, the movement of data can be really, really quick. It doesn't have to be slow. You know, Amazon S3, we often run a lot of things in Amazon. It works extremely well. Same thing in Google when we move data between you know, Google's native cloud and, and, their, and their infrastructure. So let's talk about this one, I think. So you're talking about using S3 or basically object-based storage to provide NFS storage to Kubernetes. Yep. You can do that, yes. OK. The, uh, so if you erase this from your picture, right, and you, you can coexist. And so you can say, uh, let's say you have a pause that requires, let's say, 50 terabytes of space mm -hmm. when they run. Um, but you have five copies of them, because for whatever reason. So it really needs 250 terabytes of space, but only 50 at the time it's running. All you do is create, let's say, 100 terabytes NAS volume, and everything else lives in object. When it's being used, it automatically moves back and forth. Okay. And it's Thanks. completely transparent. Kubernetes have no idea other than it might have taken a few more seconds for this pod to start up because they have to rehydrate or a terabyte of data, whatever the number is, right? Mm -hmm. And that allows you, especially when you run in the cloud, that allows you to run a really minimalistic infrastructure where you can just run only the stuff you need runs on high performance, high cost infrastructure. Everything else goes to cheaper infrastructure. So it allows you to rather than spinning up everything on, say, you know, EBS block devices, so you can just spin up only the things you really need, and everything else that's not running at the time immediately goes to S3. Right. Now, um, I don't know if this is like the Ouroboros, but uh, can you also run the DSX and Anvil components as containers within Kubernetes <laughs> along with the CSI? Could the whole thing run in, uh, in that, or is it so very soon? VM exception. Soon. <laughs> no, no. So, exactly. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the demo because uh, I know I want to show you this slide piece here. Capacity meter today, cloud software on, on various platforms, and containerized. It's really, really important to us. I mean, we're containerizing our services already. Some will be containerized you know, shortly. Sure. May not be exposed to the end user yet that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say maybe you know, first half next year, you'll start seeing us just spinning up in containers. Mm -hmm. And what's really neat with that is that things become very easily scalable at that point and very dynamically. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Because I'm going <laughs> to. Got to leave something for next year. <laughs> <laughs> minutes. And we'll probably have another cloud field day. All right, so what you have in here, see if I set anything up. I set up two storage classes, and I just want to show you this quickly. I know we all love command line. <laughs> Being an old sun guy, I love command lines, <laughs> so it's okay. So, standard storage test definition, nothing really scientific about it. A few things that are worth my mentioning. Um, one, you can put one storage class to handle both NFS back and file back volume. So you can have a single policy that drives them all, even in a single definition. So you can specify 
share names for file back volumes, which is where file represents with an internal file system inside a pod. Probably the fastest way to run a file system in there. Very easy, at least, for especially for things like Jenkins jobs and where you don't need a metadata necessarily centralized. You just want that file and everything contained within it. Objectives, that's what dictates in our product where the data gets placed. Right, and these are things that David showed a little bit earlier, not going into them too much, and obviously basic export options and formats and so forth. Uh, so we're connecting the storage classes through to one or more service level objectives that are automatically placed on those things, and those service level objectives might be dynamic in nature, conditionally applied, and, and, and lead to behaviors like promotion and demotion, automatic, et cetera. So you know, I'll take one of these storage classes. I may already have applied that one. Oh, not yet. And what will happen is that it now applies it you know, from a, it'll be pending, because what's going to happen now, it's going to, it was an NFS-based one. So it's going to go in and create a share inside our Hammerspace product using the CSI driver. And this is on on-prem. So you'll see another share in there pop in momentarily. Latency is a little high when we run things remotely for some reason. You'll see this share right here. It's yellow because it hasn't applied objectives yet. Yet You'll see this go to eight and then it'll switch to green. So now we have a share where this container is, is living. Uh, if I want to go and apply, oh, there we go. So I have a, a very simple MySQL app, right? and I have versions of that using NFS. So yes, this is a regular MySQL application. And what you'll see is inside our Hammerspace share, and now, now that I have the share up here, one, I can start replicating the share, because that's the granularity of replication is decided at the share level. The file is the mobility level, right, and the management of it. And you'll see all these uh, placements of data, by default they sit on the storage class I call MySQL production or prod, which places that on local storage. It's, it's a very simple uh, you know, objective. You can do a lot more with it. You can say when it's not active, stop moving it into, into uh, you know, object and so forth. You can say you know, when I take MySQL snapshots and so forth, when file gets older and not used, start moving them out to, to save space uh, and so forth. Yeah, and you know, if I want to put this MySQL share on another site, all I do is turn on replication. Now, what gets interesting is that you know, I prefer to do this with, with the file-based approach because it's slightly more useful in the demo, where if I create a file-based piece, it creates a five gigabyte. Someone asked about file sizes earlier. We, we really have no limitations. Uh, oops. I get for not using my own laptop. Right, so if you look in here, we just created a five gig file, and that is now what's going to represent the MySQL database. So rather than maintaining it in an FS share backend, it now sits in a file backend, which is extremely easy to, for us to replicate and make DR, DR. I mean, it's the same thing, but shows up quick, quicker. So I apply, so I take my a SQL deployment is based on a file. Same thing, just references to different PV. And you know, you'll see that pop up. Now, if I wanted to go and make my, my SQL deployment appear in Amazon and Google, right? Let's look out from here. Let's log into. It's the one next to it. It's one of the ones next to it. Yeah. It's in the tab next. Yeah. So we only don't have the global namespace in the UI just yet. So. So it's important for us to always make sure we have the right credentials so you can specify, uh, you know, 
in a, in a multi-environment that maybe a different credential, so a share can be replicated using you know, different admin credentials on another site. So now you're pushing the file system to the uh, other other cloud. Right. Well, I got all the promise. Right. So what happens now is that if you go back into piece, you see here we're sitting on prem. That's why we're doing everything on prem. You go into AWS. Oh, site C. Did I type site A? Oh, it's, it's one of the other tabs, maybe. No, it's. Uh, I might have pushed it to the wrong hammer space. Yep. How do, I, how do I get back up? To where? Yeah. The up arrow? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know why it's not working. The up arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Let's type it again. Yeah. Sorry, I pushed it to the wrong site. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Live demo. <laughs> well, now we can show multi site because we're replicating yeah. it too. Well, it, it's a like Rolex system outside, so we have multiple setups. So the site naming is something you set up just to keep it simple. Uh, and it, it's it automatically inherent and shares some of that config information between the sites, which makes it really handy because now you can just use English when you reference the sites instead of IP addresses and so forth. For as detailed as the GUI is, and, or the, as detailed as the command line is for doing these things, do you have a respective GUI that other we people will. can go and do? We will. Oh. So the. Uh, when you look at our, uh, on, on our command line, the replication piece is the only thing that's not in the UI. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, don't want to advertise it in the UI because yeah. it's uh, engineering preview right now. Mm -hmm. It's going GA late this quarter. Okay. So yeah, we haven't exposed the UI to it. And obviously it's all API driven, right? Yeah, it's all REST underneath, whether from the GUI or from the yeah, command line. Uses the same. Yeah, giant YAML file. And that allows you to script it. <laughs> you you can script it as well. Yeah. yeah. I want to push it into GCP. Oh, GCP side A. A lot of checked. So while we are doing things, let me ask a question. Um, it's about hydration and dehydration type things. So, for example, we were talking about data not being or being pulled on demand, for example, from mm -hmm, one place mm -hmm. to another. Um, so I'm thinking that between cloud and high-speed bandwidth links, it should not be a problem at all. Um, but sometimes your own pipe from your own on-premises environment to AWS might be. Um, so if your connection is being the bottleneck, are there any indications um, within the software somewhere that tells you that, you know, I'm pulling this file, but there is some latency before it available to your application, um, and that's the problem. So for example, your pipe or that bandwidth it, that it's choking. That it's waiting. So a, a couple of things on that. By the way, um, the, the way data is transferred between sites is by having object stores that are common to them, OK? Uh, and when a site goes to reconstitute something, and it's pull-based, right? Uh, even in, in a policy-based thing, it's, it's pull. The site will pull it from the most proximal object store that happens to have that hash. His own, if it's right there, or somebody else's nearer. So it can avoid the need to pull it from a high, a high latency link if, if you have a higher bandwidth link uh, nearby uh, to grab it. Um, but if it's being served as a file system, there are limited options for notifying things. The standard model in NFS is when something is unavailable, like the NFS server's down, it simply blocks and waits. Um, we have the ability through policy to change that to say, if the data is unavailable, say you only have one copy and that storage volume is offline, then if you officially declare that volume is offline, instead of having the client sit there waiting, uh, they will get an EIO and fail out because you've basically uh, taken administrative action, administrative action to say that it's down, and if the system can't find a copy elsewhere to put in place to, to use, then it'll, then it'll say, well, it's EIO for now. Um, if you leave it just, if you don't officially declare it offline, then it'll sit there and wait for it to be brought back up. So that's kind of both ends of the spectrum, sit there and wait or fail out. If you come in through Hammerspace or you look at the enhanced metadata, you can see that those things are 
uh, are are uh, being moved in the meantime, that a delay is from it. But you have to come in through a richer vantage point than just as a file system, because that's that only has the two modes, either fail or wait. So, thank you. I yeah, want to just wrap answers. up the Kubernetes piece, because we have literally three minutes. The, uh, so what you see here now, on the command line, we have, you know, on-prem, we literally, in 30 seconds, I create a global share that goes into Amazon, that runs in Amazon. Now the data can be pushed proactively or on demand or by snapshot. At the same time, I did the same thing against GCP. So uh, again, the data gets fine fanning out. You don't have to have one object store, but you could have many. Uh, you know, so the architecture supports many object stores because you may want to keep your data local on an object on each site and then rehydrate versus going across vendors and so forth. 